That's good. Welcome to you all. I'll just say again, my name is Colin Dennis. I'm chairman of the Safety and Reliability Society webinar working group. And I'm going to be chairing the session uh, today. Welcome to you all. If this is your first uh, SARS uh, lunchtime webinar, and welcome back if you've uh, joined us before. Just to say the uh, webinar is being recorded. And um, normally we present our webinars on the members area of the uh, Safety and Reliability Society website. Uh, but today, uh, so we've got one example that's actually on the public area of the website. Uh, this particular one will be uh, will be put on the public area of the website. So, uh, <clears throat> as your so the the actual presentation and the Q and A which will be run via the chat system uh, will be all part of the recording. So just so that you're aware of that when you're when you're asking questions uh, later on. So the, the program for the, today is that uh, Alec Bounds is going to give us a presentation in a couple of minutes and I'll introduce him. Then we'll uh, have a Q&A session after that. Um, the questions, if you want to ask your questions via the chat box, please, you can do that during the presentation and I'll keep track of that and come back to it uh, um, after, once the Q&A starts. But obviously we'll let Alec finish, finish the presentation before we get into the Q&A. And when, <clears throat> when we get into the Q&A properly, uh, that will also be via the chat. If you can write out the questions, I'll read them out. Alec will be able to see them as well uh, once the presentation has, uh, has finished. So I'll now uh, introduce our speaker for today. The, uh, our speaker is Alec Bounds. He's a fellow of the Safety and Reliability Society and the chief safety editor of the Safety and Reliability Journal. Alec has worked in the nuclear safety field for three decades, Sellafield and several other nuclear sites in the UK. He specializes in processes and methods for the production of nuclear safety cases. Alec is an associate technical director at Arcadis. has worked for Arcadis for the last nine years and is their, their capability lead for nuclear safety. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Alec to talk to us about the hidden hazards of materials. Alec. Okay, thank you, Colin. Just check uh, that you can still hear me. Can you still hear me, Colin? <laughs> um, Sorry, I'd muted my mic. Yes, I can still hear you. Okay, great. That's excellent. <clears throat> and Colin's just mentioned that uh, I'm the uh, chief safety editor of the Safety Reliability Journal. So I'd like to encourage all of you uh, to do have a think about what you can share in the uh, that type of uh, format. Um, we're always uh, looking for um, new articles, really, uh, in, for the journal. Anyway, this um, uh, presentation is all about hidden hazards of uh, materials. And you could also say it's all about mindsets. And I'll, that will become clear as uh, uh, we go through the slides. There's only 14 slides. Um, so, um, radioactive waste is obviously an example of hazardous material. We've got high level waste, intermediate level waste, and low level waste. Um, and that's a, been a scheme that's been used uh, for decades. Uh, possibly the thing that um, matters most uh, out of those is that high level, weight, high level waste generates uh, significant quantities of heat. Um, and that's uh, if it's in liquid form, that's enough to boil the liquid. So it's uh, very, very radioactive. And the arrow there is a sort of indication of uh, danger levels, if you like. And by the time you get down to uh, low level waste, um, if you're a nuclear safety assessor, then you start to breathe the uh, sort of sigh of relief uh, that the hazards aren't going to be that bad. Um, so that's a sort of uh, mindset that uh, a lot of nuclear safety assessors would have, I would think. Um, let's move on. So in terms of this presentation, uh, I want to share experience of um, demonstrating the safety of receipt storage and handling of radioactive materials. And as we do so, we'll discover that um, we need to keep a, an open mind about uh, the hazards of, of materials in general. I'm going to propose some key words to prompt identification of inherent hazards of materials. And I'd also like to um, question the traditional classifications of radioactive waste I just showed on the last slide as to whether they're still 
appropriate. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, we'll all have a, a great understanding of hazards of materials. So in terms of contents, uh, I want to talk about the inherent hazards of radioactive waste um, and then move into a couple of case studies, which I think are probably the main part of the presentation. Um, a little bit on how materials interact with containment. And uh, then I'll uh, propose some in inherent material property keywords, which might be a help um, to various people. And finally, um, do a comparison with uh, the traditional classifications of radioactive waste that I've um, uh, shown earlier. So that's what's coming up. So in terms of inherent hazards of radioactive waste, um, we start thinking as nuclear safety assessors about the radiation type. So uh, is it an alpha emitter or is it a gamma emitter? It might be a mixture of the two. Um, now gamma is, um, can get through uh, most materials, gamma rays get through most materials. So you have to have very thick shielding to uh, attenuate the gamma dose rate. You might think that's, uh, that gamma emitters are therefore the uh, um, things of most concern. But um, let's just move on to the alpha. So alpha emitters. Now alpha uh, emissions can be stopped by a piece of paper. So that doesn't sound very um, hazardous. Uh, but um, if there is, a, if any alpha activity is breathed into the body, um, then it's much worse actually than um, than gamma, in fact. So with alpha emitting materials, we need to uh, have excellent containment of the material. And uh, quite often that is uh, containment supplemented by ventilation that uh, sort of reinforces uh, the containment properties. Um, so we certainly need to understand how um, any release of activity or any like loss of shielding could affect um, people. We also need to be thinking about uh, the fissile content of uh, the material and the most uh, common or most obvious one of those is plutonium. Um, if there is a critical mass of uh, plutonium or, or any other fissile material, then uh, you will get what's called a criticality. And that can give a fatal dose to a worker uh, in a matter of uh, seconds. So that's um, a really crucial thing to avoid. In a nuclear reactor, uh, there's a controlled criticality going on. Um, here we're talking about accidental criticality. Um, and then we have whether, whether the heat produces waste or not, sorry, produces heat or not. And if it does produce heat, then the material needs to be cooled and it needs to be cooled all the time. You can't just say, well, for the next eight hours, we're not going to uh, cool it because that could possibly cause problems. So it's much better to have uh, passive cooling for um, heat producing waste, which is high level waste. So I hope just by um, presenting this slide, I've, even if you're not a nuclear safety assessor, which I imagine most of you are not, um, then you've sort of entered my world a little bit <laughs> and perhaps my mindset. Um, this is what we need to think about. Nuclear safety assessors uh, spend almost all their time on these types of considerations. And uh, we look at, uh, as I say, loss of shielding, loss of containment, that sort of thing, loss of cooling as well, which leads on to a loss of containment. Um, and we consider the potential accidental uh, radiation doses to workers or the public. So um, nuclear safety assessors might say, as long as we know the radioactive content, uh, we can start the safety assessments, and, and there's a lot of truth in that. Um, 
so there's a focus on the radioactive content. We're going to move on to the first case study now. Um, I'm sure you look at the picture before looking at the text. So that's a picture of uh, a, um, a container. It's like half the height of a shipping container, if that makes sense to you. Um, and that, that is what is used to contain low level waste, uh, typically. Um, before being transported from the site where the waste has been produced, uh, the lid will, uh, a lid will be put on, um, and uh, later on, when the um, when the, when the container is grouted, um, a, a grout port in that lid will be opened, and and grout will be fed into the container to fill it right up. So that's the sort of basic process. And let's come back to the first bullet. There are some um, old drums known as uh, hex drums, implying a uh, presence of either uranium hexafluoride or um, uranium tetrafluoride, um, which is part of the hex production process, which is important for, um, for nuclear fuel production. Okay, so if we're thinking about, well, what are the hazards of this, particularly at the facility where the, um, where the container will be grouted, then, then we need to start thinking about the issues I've, I've already mentioned. Um, and we also need to consider the uranium radioactivity to see if it exceeds concentration limits for the waste. Um, and in this case, it was all fine. Um, there were no real issues uh, there. So um, the question is really, are there any other hazards? Um, now, the facility where these containers are grouted has um, conditions for acceptance. And uh, those conditions exclude uh, a wide range of hazardous waste. So for example, it excludes toxic chemicals. Um, which is fair enough, um, and you know a whole range of other things as well. So um, we might sort of think that everything's okay at that point, uh, but uh, we would be wrong. And I will show you uh, on the next slide. Um, I'm sure you look at the pictures again. So this is um, showing burns from hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is quite a nasty acid because um, it will uh, sort of seep into the skin. The, the HF molecules are very, very small and they can pass through to the bloodstream. Um, and you might not feel that much at the time when the acid uh, gets onto your uh, fingers or any other part of your body. Um, uh, but um, later on, it will become very evident as shown on those pictures. Uh, those pictures are, are not from any nuclear facility, um, but it does graphically illustrate the danger of, of HF. And in fact, you can die from, from HF. Uh, so it's a particularly nasty acid and it's got that particularly nasty uh, effect, if you like, of making people think they haven't been burnt too badly. Uh, so they don't seek medical help uh, straight away, which they do need to. So coming back to the, um, the container and uh, the waste in it, and in this case, as I said, it's uh, got uranium, uh, uranium fluoride of some sort. Um, so when the waste is grouted, what happens? Well, grout um, contains water, um, and that reacts with the uranium fluorides to produce hydrofluoric acid. And we just talked about how nasty uh, that is. So maybe HF could get released in the waste disposal facility. Um, maybe there could be uh, preferential pathways for radioactive material to escape from the um, matrix, uh, which is not a good thing for, um, obviously, if you wanted to keep, as we do, want to keep radioactive material in the place where it should be. So a chemotoxic safety assessment was required. And um, this is just, 
an example really um, of how we, we need to think wider than our, our mindset. So our mindset in this case was radioactivity, fissile content, that sort of thing. That didn't help us identify the hydrofluoric acid hazard. Now, interestingly, uh, this uh, facility in its uh, conditions for acceptance um, prohibits any strong ac strong acids being received. So that's good. But what it didn't do was exclude materials that can react with water to produce strong acids, uh, which it does now. So um, that was sort of a lesson, really, that we hadn't covered every angle um, in terms of uh, hazards. Um, as ideally the conditions for acceptance would would sort of make sure that the hazards are well understood and within um, a sort of safe envelope. So uh, the key message there is that radioactive waste can be hazardous uh, for other reasons than its radioactivity. Um, so uh, hopefully that's clear enough as a case study and I'm going to rely on Colin if there's something that is just not at all obvious then <laughs> Colin, feel free to ask a question as we go along, because I know you have that facility. So that's really the end of um, this particular case study. And I'm going to move on to uh, the next case study. And this is about um, some metal uh, that's stored in uh, mild steel drums. It was expected to be uh, intermediate level waste. Um, but radioactive decay means that the material is now or soon will be low level waste. And um, that's actually one small advantage of radioactive waste over, say, chemical waste that uh, over periods of time, which vary from sort of seconds to um, millions of years, um, the radioactivity means that uh, the amount of radioactive material does uh, decrease over time. Okay, so uh, in this case, um, environmental implications were considered um, and there was no HF issue, so that was good. Um, the, as long as the um, radioactive material was within, was within the low level waste limits, then the nucleus education shouldn't have to change, it already bounds the, um, those limits. So that's absolutely fine. Now, one thing that uh, the conditions for acceptance uh, do include that I haven't mentioned yet is uh, a, a limit on the amount of um, surface area of reactive metal. Um, and that's because if um, reactive, reactive metal gets in contact with uh, the water and the grout, then you can get hydrogen produced typically. Um, so the amount of metal uh, surface area is uh, restricted, which is fair enough. Um, now there was quite a lot of surface area here. Um, and so it was decided to super compact uh, the metal uh, to make it into pucks. And you can see in the diagram um, what a puck might look like. Um, and that basically means that there's no uh, metal inside the drum is really exposed or could be exposed to to the grout. So that is um, a good step forward, it seems. Okay, so I think um, we will move on. So I think I've explained how, about how the hydrogen can be produced. It's a reactive metal combining with uh, water in the grout. Okay, but the, we discover that there is some inherent moisture in the waste, um, um, possibly related to how it's been stored in the past. And that reacts with the metal before the metal is exposed to water in the grout. So even when it's on the uh, waste producing site, um, some hydrogen is being produced. So, um, we need to think then about the transport operation because during transport, uh, the container is fully sealed. Um, even after it's uh, received, um, what happens is that a vent port at one end of the container is open, which gives some ventilation. Um, but the question is, is it, 
enough ventilation to stop uh, the uh, existence of a hydrogen concentration uh, that would uh, give it an explosion. So uh, the lower flammable limit uh, for hydrogen is 4% uh, hydrogen in, uh, in air. Um, and the nuclear industry would normally uh, work to a quarter of that value for, for normal conditions. So we aim to uh, not exceed 1% in normal conditions. Um, so we could do that. And as long as we control the number of pucks uh, in the container, then uh, that was absolutely fine. OK. Um, so we've really covered all the stages. The stages are transport, um, receipt, and then grouting. And I suppose there's a stage afterwards, which is uh, um, letting uh, the grout cure after, afterwards. OK, uh, so you might think, well, that's fine. But in fact, um, tests are carried out uh, to be sure that we've sort of understood this uh, system well enough. And the tests actually reveal that um, supercompaction increases the rate of hydrogen production from what it was before, which was unexpected. Nobody expected that at all. Um, so by solving one problem, which it relates to um, making sure there isn't too much reactive metal surface area exposed to grout. Um, we've sort of created a, another problem, um, but uh, we can control that as well. So we can, if we reduce the, allow, uh, uh, the allowed number of pucks in the container further, then we know we're going to be safe. And other aspects of this will be journey times, which are very conservatively estimated and all that sort of thing. So. Um, that seems to be OK. And we've got hydrogen sorted for transport, initial storage. We have the grouting step covered by the super compaction process. Um, after grouting, there's generally uh, no space in the container for hydrogen to accumulate. But on some occasions, you, you don't fully fill uh, the uh, container. So anyway, this sort of basically seems OK. We've got all the stages covered. but by looking at the question mark in the bottom banner there, <laughs> you can probably guess that uh, there's something else that uh, we should have thought thought of. OK, and it's really nothing to do with the radioactive materials to start off with. Um, it's basically to remember that grout curing produces heat. So even if there's no radioactive material, um, just uh, as the grout um, effectively dries and as it um, as it solidifies, it produces heat. So, and uh, what we also discovered was that the hydrogen generation rate uh, doubles for each 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, roughly. Um, and what's more, we didn't really have any data on temperatures at the center of the disposal container. <laughs> so during grouting, there was, there's going to be a uh, higher uh, rate of hydrogen generation um, than we had previously thought. And that would come from the inherent moisture, not from reaction with the water in the grout. So um, it's like a, a double effect of grouting, if you like. It, it, it gives water, and we dealt with that. Um, but it also uh, gives heat, and we hadn't thought of that until this moment. Um, and so uh, we had to deal with that, and we had to work out um, what the temperature in the center of the disposal container would be, etc. So, um, and in the end, we managed to demonstrate safety, but it, it was quite a big job to do, and it was a much bigger job than we thought because we, you know, we thought started off thinking, well, this is low level waste um, and we've got it covered anyway so it's just an interesting um, example really of how um, you can have a certain mindset that uh, that sort of might pretend to be open but isn't really open enough to other hazards that could be uh, significant and and potentially effectively the the in this case certainly the 
uh, hazard of hydrogen explosion um, was more significant than than anything to do with the radioactivity. Um, there have been cases where people have uh, nuclear safety assessors have assessed hydrogen explosions and worked out what the um, internal dose of someone is from breathing in the release of airborne activity and uh, perhaps sometimes they've identified that as a low consequence um, but haven't necessarily thought about or what about the physical effects of the explosion and someone might actually be killed by those physical effects of pressure wave etc uh, and by um, things flying through the air at them and, 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 and uh, seriously injuring or potentially killing them. So we had to sort of open our minds to a different world, if you like, um, in order to uh, cover the hazards properly and to demonstrate safety properly. So that's, that's the end of that uh, case today. Um, but we don't just need to think about the uh, material. Um, we also need to think about uh, containment. If we take an example of uh, plutonium, this uh, emits alpha particles, as I've said before, it's stopped by a piece of paper, it doesn't sound too bad. Um, and it is really fairly harmless unless alpha emitting material gets inside the body. Now, how is it actually um, contains uh, plutonium dioxide powder is kept in PVC bags and that's inside uh, other layers of containment that I won't go into. But the um, PVC bag turns out to be uh, of significant interest because alpha particles can produce hydrogen and therefore there could be a potential explosion. Um, produce hydrogen from the PVC by radiolysis. So uh, radiolysis is the, the dissociation molecules caused by ionizing radiation. Um, so although a piece of paper can stop the alpha particle, if you have uh, this uh, plutonium wrapped in PVC, then you do need to think about um, how much hydrogen is produced. Now, compared to chemical ways of producing hydrogen, radiolysis tends to be a fairly, um, sort of low powered way of producing hydrogen. So it's generally not a massive problem, but I suppose it's just really saying that as well as thinking about the actual material, we need to think about the immediate containment um, when identifying hazards. So I'm getting towards the end of the presentation now, and these are uh, my proposed inherent material property keywords. So you might have Others that you can add, um, but I think when we're thinking, looking at material, we need to think about the physical form. Um, is it a solid block? Is it a powder, a liquid gas? Is it a mixture of the above? Uh, and certainly in the nuclear, nuclear industry, we have a lot of issue with sludges and particulate in air is a significant issue for airborne uh, contamination and therefore uh, internal dose to people, to workers. Need to be thinking about gas production, particularly explosive gases. And we've talked about hydrogen today, um, either from radiolysis or from reaction with a, um, a chemical reaction, that is. Need to think about the radionuclides, uh, what type of radiation they're emitting, and also, as I said before, the fissile and fissionable radionuclides. There are also biological issues. What if you've got putrescent or pathogenic material um, that's associated uh, with perhaps the waste that you thought you were taking uh, this is sort of added on well that's its own hazard um, chemical constituents that need to think about uh, toxic chemicals um, and then flammability as well is obviously important um, and within that pyrophoricity which is where a material can just burst into flames um, on its own really without any um, additional um, uh, additional things such as an ignition source or whatever. Uh, so that's um, sort of a small subset, I suppose, of flammability. And what we often find is that inherent hazards can, can dominate the uh, safety case. Um, so anyway, I'm sure that's not an absolutely complete list, but it's a good starter for thinking about 
materials and how they could be hazardous. Um, let's move on. Hold on. Okay. So when we think about the traditional classification of radioactive waste, and we think high level, intermediate level, and low level, I think it's fairly clear that they don't necessarily reflect the complexity of the inherent hazards associated with the radioactive waste. Um, and it almost seems like it's too simple. Uh, uh, I like simplicity, but <laughs> like this particular scheme, I wonder if it's um, enough uh, for the future. It may be more useful to focus on what an individual uh, waste site or repository uh, can take um, rather than just using those classifications, which have served us well for decades, but uh, perhaps they don't really tell us enough about uh, the hazards. So conclusions, um, we need to think outside the box. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, Matt Miller, my, uh, my graduate for the picture there. Um, so depending on the mindset of the safety assessor, hazards can effectively be hidden. I mean, the hazards we we're talking about in those case studies were pretty obvious to someone who understands chemical hazards and who understands explosions. Uh, but uh, perhaps, um, they would also struggle themselves to understand enough about radioactive material and the hazards it produces. So we need to think widely and um, get input uh, from elsewhere if it's going out beyond our um, sort of zone of experience. Those in inherent material property keywords may be useful uh, for people. Um, and the final one, and the conclusion is that traditional radioactive waste classifications are only a small part of the information uh, required to ensure safety um, of, uh, of radioactive material. Um, so we do need to think uh, more about the actual uh, material we're getting. So the overall message, which I think applies outside the nuclear industry as well, is look for hidden hazards as well as the obvious hazards. I wonder, um, I mean, I'm going to hand back to Colin, I suppose, just now. I wonder if um, anyone on the call has experience of uh, missing a, uh, what you might call a non-obvious hazard that turned out to be more significant than what was thought at the time originally to be the main hazard. So I'll finish there. Okay, thank you very much, Alec. That's uh, really uh, interesting examples and certainly... Uh showing how we need to uh, be thinking about the uh, the broader range of hazards. Um, so now is a, a, an opportunity to uh, to ask questions. Uh, we have one question already from David Stevens. Uh, David says, can sulfur hexafluoride used in HV, uh, HV electrical switch gear evolve hydrofluoric acid in the same way as the uh, uranium um, you can't put hexafluoride, yeah. hexafluoride, sorry, that, uh, that uh, you, were, you were referring to, Alec. Um, I don't know the chemistry of uh, FF6, um, but I would imagine that if it gets in contact with water, that there's a possibility, at least, in certain conditions of uh, producing hy hydrofluoric acid. Um, but if anybody else on the call can answer that question, that would be great. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know enough about uh, sulfur um, hexafluoride. I do, I do know it is widely used in electrical switch gear um, because it's got very good uh, properties for electrical insulation. Um, so I don't know whether, I mean, you want to keep water out of those types of facilities anyway, I suppose, <laughs> because of the electrical uh, hazard and, elect and electrocution and so on. Um, but. Um, yeah, I, I do wonder because uh, fluorine is, uh, even, even when it's part of a uh, compound, can be quite reactive. Could I uh, ask you a question about the guide words, Alec? Go yeah, back, sure. Can you, just back, yeah. can you just go back to the slide on with the, with the guide words? Yes, yeah. So, in, in, if you were you know, tackling your example of the container with the grout and the water, yeah. Um, can you just sort of give me an idea of how you use these guide words? Because I mean, you can see the guide words in relation to the fact that we, you know, we now know about that hazard. But how would you how would you use these guide words to sort of tease that out of the 
the things if if the water reaction with the grout causes the uh, hydrogen okay, so, wasn't otherwise um, known. Basically, um, I think what you would want to do is to sort of create a, a little process diagram. It doesn't have to be a, a highly engineered one, it's just a, a sort of a small one of uh, a, a very basic stages, including you know, waste at the, at the originating site, um, transport, receipt, initial storage, um, grouting, and then after grouting um, when it, uh, the curing takes place and apply these keywords to each of those stages and um, I, I think you know we use guide words obviously in, in HAZOP and other um, techniques um, but this is something that you can use probably um, at a really early stage once you know the basics of the process that you've got and without knowing exactly you know what the containers are and uh, exactly how much you've got of uh, what of the material does that make sense as, as an answer yeah i get it i mean so, so if you were starting with that case study number one coming in yeah. how how would you pick up that because it's, it's almost an unknown unknown I, I, it sounds <laughs> like. yes. um, and i'm always I'm always you know which is which is the problem here isn't it that it is an unknown unknown until you know about it um, so, yes. in, so in terms of unless you happen to have somebody around the table who's got that expertise that, that knows the reaction of that grout with the water is going to cause hydrogen or the um, no, um, the hydrofluoric it, acid yes. hydrofluoric acid yeah. rather, sorry um, in, yeah. uh, it, it's going to be difficult to, to kind of tease it out yes and and I think you know that when you are applying these guide words, if you don't have the expertise, you need to ask somebody who, who does. Now, mm. you know, to go beyond that, uh, just like uh, chemical constituents um, keyword to, um, you know, everything that, that chemicals can do is obviously <laughs> mm. uh, very difficult. So I think that's why in those cases, you'd need the expertise. Um, you know, with biological issues, you might say, well, you might find out, well, there's no way that biological material can get into here. Uh, you know, it's an industrial process and and it's not open to the atmosphere, that sort of thing. And you can maybe dismiss it quite quickly. Um, you know, pyrophoricity is, a, is probably a bit similar to chemical constituents in that you maybe don't know what all the pyrophoric uh, chemicals are that exist um, <laughs> so some of it is to do with experience um, and uh, you know what people have discovered before but uh, you know you also need to be thinking about getting the expertise in um, the nuclear industry tends to focus much more on like the radionuclides the gas yeah. production and the physical form <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. and you know the physical form is extraordinarily um, significant so if you have powder instead of a solid block um, then you know you've got the potential to create airborne contamination that could get into a breathing zone of somebody um, it's you know the, the the actual physical form is is a massive factor we often think oh yeah solid liquid gas yeah we all know about that <laughs> but um, in reality uh, it it's absolutely huge and so is the containment and the ventilation it goes goes with that um, typically sure. I mean are these are these um, keywords have you done any sort of paper on this or is it something that other people can, can access or sort of thoughts on it is that um, yeah, so I mean, I think maybe, maybe, it's journal. Journal. <laughs> maybe it's a journal. Maybe it's a journal. Should take my own advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, possibly. Um, yes, uh, I have a feeling that I still don't know quite enough, if you know what I mean. Uh, and mm. I would like uh, this. You know, I'd like um, people to be commenting on this and giving me uh, feedback. Um, and probably at this point. Maybe I'll give my email address if that's all right. So yeah, it's al alec.bounds at arcadis.com. Um, so I think you've seen all those words somewhere apart from .com <laughs> on the presentation. Um, so, yeah, if you've got other things where you think you could build on this um, or even have something slightly different that you might mm -hmm. think is more powerful, um, that's absolutely fine. Um, 
but this is what I've got to so far. And uh, my feeling is that, um, you know, people who, who deal with uh, process uh, safety are probably going to have um, a fair bit to say on this so that I perhaps don't know enough about. Um, mm. But certainly I've learned quite a lot um, and I'm happy mm. to share what I've got so far. <laughs> and, mm. you know, if people want to use these keywords um, in a real situation, um, you know, then uh, let me know how it goes. Uh, I'm not copywriting them. <laughs> um, so uh, and when it gets into the journal, then, you know, um, copying directly from the journal won't be allowed if it does go to the journal. At this stage, mm -hmm. I'm much more interested in people, um, you know, um, thinking widely about safety uh, and yeah, not yeah, just yeah. keeping within their own area of expertise. Yeah, I guess I guess the essence is that that thinking about all those aspects of it rather than just the ones you think you know about. I guess is the is the yeah is the yeah. Key, is the key message. I think it is, and if you're unsure, then you know clearly it's important mm. to consult. <laughs> um, has, has anyone else on the call got experience of this? We haven't had any other questions coming in as yet. Uh, it'd be interesting to know if uh, if people uh, have, uh, have experienced. The unknown hazards coming coming out in the, via, via via other means um, certainly yeah, sounds like a sens sensible approach to ask about all these different uh, these different aspects of it. I mean, so, that, you know, that would be interesting for definite. Um, and I suppose you could say, um, let's you know, think about um, safety of aeroplanes. Um, you might think, well, that's mainly to do with. Uh, you know how the engines work and the various controls and all that and get sort of fixed on that and not think about um what the batteries are made of and whether they might catch fire well, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so you it know, has been done it has been done yes yeah. uh, and um maybe someone thought about it but not quite enough you know um yeah, sure. not having the right expertise in the room so um these things can happen where you sort of you know a huge amount about your own area and mm. you know you know you get very confident and and potentially overconfident i suppose is the issue uh, where mm. you and safety i think safety assessors uh, safety people in general should never really be overconfident <laughs> um so we just had a had a uh, rwm sorry can you yes, see another the contribution? Yes. Yeah, can you see the question? Yes, yeah, so consider, considers many of these issues an acceptance criteria for high level waste. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> um, yeah. And What's RWM? So that would be radioactive waste management. Uh -huh. um, okay. They tend to deal with intermediate level waste and, and high level waste um, in terms of a future. Uh, um underground facility um that doesn't exist yet so um that's good to know uh, <laughs> um so we're so to the example of the, the reaction with the grout i mean presumably that was yeah. that that was known before and that, that wasn't the first time that you'd come across that was it or, or was it well, in terms of um, yeah, rea reactive metal, reactive metals reacting with with grout was understood um, mm -hmm. and well known as as a means of producing hydrogen. Hydrogen is quite a big issue in the nuclear industry. I um, uh, haven't had to deal with it very much until recent years, but um, it really is um, a difficult thing to deal with, um, mm -hmm. and and because it's such a small molecule as well. Um, it's very difficult to argue that any containment will um, always contain it, uh, un okay. unless unless you want the opposite. If you see what I mean. yeah, so if, if if you want it to be contained, say well, I can't guarantee that. And if you if you say well, surely most of it will get out um, of a container, and you won't get the hydrogen uh, um, concentration that's needed for explosion neither will anybody substantiate that either. <laughs> so, mm. you get caught between two stools um, sure. so, mm. so there are you know some of these things are well known um but perhaps um you know things like hydrofluoric acid um i mean some some nuclear safety assessors and some nuclear criteria 
like don't really extend to chemotoxic uh, hazards um so uh you know some people might feel um that they were perfectly within their rights to focus just on the nuclear um but in this case it would be ignoring the main hazards which isn't good enough <laughs> no, no, sure. yes. I, I could see that james catmull there we go okay Pyrite. So, shall I read that out? So, yeah, pyrite, yeah. which is iron sulfide, if I've said that correctly, is a classic problem material. Uh, so, if it's from pyrite rot, possibly biological cause, creates sulfuric acid and burns well, and not that well known. Okay, well, I hadn't heard about it either. <laughs> um, I haven't heard about that in the nuclear industry, but um, that might be because I just haven't come across it. Uh, but perhaps elsewhere too it's something to look out for uh, there's an awful lot of iron around and there's probably quite a lot of uh, sulfur around so yes i'm um, not quite sure how how the biological cause of that works but uh, perhaps that's not the main point it's just saying we need to look out for it so when when you constitute a hazard team or something to look at these at, at any stage of the design would expertise in chemical reactions and things be, be typical typical expertise that, that you that you would get involved well i think it, it would vary um and in the past i think i'd probably say well not normally um but i think now we're beginning to get to a point where we feel okay. yeah we should be thinking about that um uh, clearly we try to get everybody in the same you know everybody in the room knows enough in total um uh, and one of the biggest issues, you know, that we tend to focus on is getting enough operational expertise in the room so that they can tell us what really happens in the process. Yeah, sure. um, but um, understanding the material is absolutely key, uh, as I think I've illustrated. And and so, you know, we should be um, making sure that uh, um, we have that expertise if we're if we're not confident ourselves. And there is also, you know, and, and being aware of the potential for overconfidence as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, well, we don't seem to have any more questions. So no, uh, fine. Unless, uh, unless there's anything else coming in, I will thank you again very much for going through that and answering the, uh, the questions on that, Alec. And uh, we look That's forward okay. to uh, perhaps uh, getting some further feedback if other people have got examples on that. Uh, by, by your email or directly to uh, to SARS at webinar at sars.org.uk uh, so I'll just close the presentation down and then um, give a couple of slides on, uh, on, on the, the whole uh, webinar process for SARS and then we'll move on to the, uh, the feedback if that's okay well, thank you very much again Alec and appreciate okay, the time Alec. today Okay, so just open up the next presentation and just stay on the line. So, as I mentioned at the start, or, or accessing the webinar recordings, all of the webinar recordings um, that we've done so far, and we've got about a dozen on the site, are, are they're archived under the resources tab on the SARS website. They're only accessible to the SARS members. Um, but this particular webinar that you've been listening to today is uh, uh, will be available in the public area. The webinar will be uh, uploaded onto the SARS website in, in a few days' time uh, once we've processed it. Uh, joining SARS, um, as you know, SARS is a, uh, it's a membership organization and rely on members uh, for the wider development of, uh, of, of safety and reliability and risk management practice uh, for the benefit of yourselves and for the, uh, for the organization. Being a member of SARS is, is, is a recognition of your, ex of your expertise. We do provide a route to professional registration. As many of you know, we are applying to become a licensed member of the Engineering Council ourselves. You should know about the outcome of that in a couple of months' time. Uh, we do rely on, on the growing membership to ensure our success. And if you like the webinar, then please think about joining. But uh, if you don't want to be a full member, we do have a, a class of membership called Associate of the Society, uh, which allows access to all the uh, resources on the resources tab of the uh, the website the webinars journals and other resources it's a simple form to fill in and 
that's not uh, currently 90 pounds a year and the, the details of that are available on the SARS website uh, upcoming events uh, we have i just wanted to announce a, a new uh, webinar initiative which is going to start in february february the 19th a series of six lunchtime webinars on the basics of risk management they will use a, a single example to allow a full picture of the safety life cycle by exploring different aspects during each webinar um, they aim to get you all thinking on about your day-to-day -day jobs and how you can improve management in these areas uh, all six are available on the SARS website for registration. If you want to uh, have a look on sars.org.uk and uh, log on to the, uh, register for those, that would be, uh, be good. It's open to members and non-members. And I think this is quite a, an exciting initiative. This will run in parallel with all the other uh, webinars that we're also running. So probably going to have a, a couple per month uh, going forward for the next six months or so. So look out for that and hopefully that will be of, uh, of interest to you. Um, I'm now going to initiate a feedback form. Um, learning from uh, from your experience is uh, is very valuable to us. Please can I ask you to fill it in. Um, it'll just take a couple of minutes to do. And uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. And thank again, thanks again to Alec for uh, giving up the time, giving us an excellent presentation. Certainly, uh, a lot to think about uh, going forward in relation to uh, hidden hazards that uh, that might be associated with uh, with materials.